All right, it's time to get started recording another radio broadcast this week. We're thankful that you folks are tuning in. It's a great blessing. We appreciate the many that we hear from who listen uh, via our social media outlets. That's a blessing. I do ask if you would to continue liking and sharing the video so other folks can listen and watch. That's the only way we have of promoting this and getting it uh, into more people's uh, hands. So we thank you so much for doing that. All right, we're going to get started now. Hey man, well, it's good to be back on the radio again today. We certainly do appreciate the good Lord allowing us to be able to come to you by means of radio. This is the Bear Trail Baptist Church broadcast, and we certainly are privileged to be the pastor there, Brother Tim Krotz. And we certainly are grateful that you take time out of your uh, busy lifestyle every single week to listen to our radio program. We thank you for that. We thank you for those that we hear from that communicate with us uh, concerning listening to the radio. We thank you for that as well. If you'd like more information about our church, you can visit our church website, BearTrailBaptistChurch.com. Uh, there is information regarding our church, the location of our church, our service times uh, is on the website as well. There's also directions to the church. There's information uh, as far as what we believe, our doctrinal statement as well. And also there are sermons on the website preached by myself, our assistant pastor, Brother Kyle Hillman, and others uh, from our church as well. I'm sure there'll be a help and a blessing to you. Well, we're going to get right in the message today. We're continuing in Psalm 16. I think this is the, I don't know, this may be the fourth sermon. I'm not sure, third or fourth sermon uh, from Psalm 16, and there'll be several more probably as well. But we'll pray and we'll continue uh, from this great psalm today. Father, we love you. We thank you that we have this effectual open door. Uh, you've allowed us to be able to preach on the radio for a number of years. And we're very thankful that we're able to continue to do that. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful church family who gives so uh, generously and so faithfully to the work and the ministry of the Lord. Uh, Lord, there's no way we would have a ministry without these folks who faithfully support us. And we're so grateful for that. I pray that you'd bless them and encourage them to continue, uh, Lord, to, to give and to work and to labor and to pray. And Lord, you're certainly a blessing our church abundantly. And we thank you so much for that. I pray you'd help me today to be a blessing to the folks who are listening to the radio, and we'll certainly give you all the praise and honor and glory for that, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 16, we're going to just jump right in. Verse number one, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says in verse number one, hold on one second here, got something going on. The Bible says in verse number one, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. So we see in verse number one of Psalm 16, we see the preservation prayer of David. David believes that God will preserve him because that's how or that and he has trust in the fact that God will preserve him. Verse number two, we see the perception and praise of David. He said, O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my God, thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. David makes a great proclamation and a great praise in verse number two, that the Lord is his God. David also understands that his goodness does not extend to the Lord, and my goodness doesn't extend to the Lord either. I'm glad that he is good to me. What a blessing it is that the Lord Jesus Christ saw fit to love us in spite of the fact that we are unlovable. We see in verse number three, we see the pleasure from saints. David said, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. I hope you have some good Christian friends, some good brothers and sisters in Christ that you can take pleasure in. It's a pleasure to fellowship with them. It's a pleasure to serve with them. It's a pleasure to worship with them. It's a pleasure to uh, be in their presence. And I certainly hope that you're the kind of Christian that is a pleasure for other believers to be around as well. Verse number four, we see the problem with idolatry. The Bible says in verse number four, their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings and uh, their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor will nor take up their names into my lips. And so we see the problem with idolatry. David had no desire to be involved in idolatry in any way, form or fashion. He said their sorrows are going to be multiplied. 
He said, I will not in no way, form, or fashion offer any of their drink offerings. He said, in fact, he just continues on with his disgust for idolatry. In fact, he said, in fact, their names will not even be on my lips. In other words, I won't even mention those false gods and those idols. I have no desire to even have their names cross my lips. Now, verse number five and verse number six is where we'll begin today. We finished with verse number four on last week's broadcast. In verse number five, the psalmist said, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. Verse six, the lines, or the lines, L-I-N-E-S, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Now, what we see here in verse number five and six, the portion of the saints, David, if you remember, was excluded by Saul's henchman, if you will, if you'd like to refer to him as that, from his share of his family inheritance. In fact, Dave, but David wasn't too bitterly concerned about that. He made known to you and I in this psalm that he has a better inheritance. He said, I have the Lord. He is making mention of the fact or allowing you and I to know that I have no treasure that I value more highly than my Lord. Listen, friend, to all, I guess I have no idea what it's like, but to possess great wealth, uh, I, I'm sure would be in, in many ways, it would be very satisfying, especially to the flesh. But I promise you this, to possess great wealth, but not have the Lord is certainly poverty indeed. And to enjoy gifts that we could have bestowed upon us by others and by the Lord being uh, prosperous towards us and to ignore the giver of those things would certainly be wickedness indeed. Listen, the Bible says in the, in the gospel of Luke and verse number 12 uh, or Luke chapter 12, verse number 13, the Bible says, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So there, there's one of the company that's came to Jesus and apparently he has his family, I should say, has received an inheritance and the brother, his brother has taken the inheritance and left him with little or with none. And here's what Jesus' answer was to him. And he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And so the Lord here, he told this man, he said, uh, he, he said, Beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things that he has. Listen, friend, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when all of my worldly possessions are going to be absolutely worthless to me. There's coming a day for you, friend. I have no idea who's listening. It may be poverty or you, you may be very prosperous and very wealthy. There's coming a day when all of your possessions, regardless of how great or how few, they're going to be absolutely worthless to you. The, this passage goes on to say in verse number 16, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he, and he thought within himself, that was his problem. He was thinking himself instead of trusting the Lord. He thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all of my goods. And I will say unto my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Listen, friend, we are foolish when we try to put things before the Lord. We are foolish when we do put things before the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us in this parable. David's here, David's cup, his substance, his daily food and refreshment were in the Lord. Dumb idols could never satisfy or never offer what the psalmist had in the Lord Jesus Christ or in Jehovah, if you will. And so he made known unto us that the Lord is his portion. Here's a great story. 
John Phillips shares a story of a born-again ruler in, King, in, in England, King George VI. Before King George ascended to his throne, he would make regular visits to a church in London and enjoy weekly Bible readings. After he became king, he had to discontinue this practice, but he remained a faithful, devoted believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the course of his duties, King George traveled to Canada, and his responsibilities carried him to British Columbia. It was thought by the Canadian officials that the king might want to meet a native-born Indian chief. Uh, the chief that was chosen was Chief Whitefeather. The chief was asked to sing something for the king, and they assumed that he would sing an Indian war song. Whitefeather, however, was a Christian, and he had a different song in mind. One can picture the surprise of the officials when Chief Whitefeather began to sing, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than house or land. I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hands than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. The stunned Canadian official waited to see what King George would do. They did not have to wait long. The king went over and he took Chief Whitefeather by the hand and he said, I'd rather have Jesus too. Amen. Listen, listen, God is our portion. If we have Christ, we lack nothing. And if you lack Christ, you lack everything. Amen. Maybe the, the quote actually goes like this. If you have Christ, you lack nothing. If you lack Christ, you have nothing. And so David rejoiced in his heritage and in his inheritance from the Lord. Now we will praise the Lord. He will praise the Lord for his counsel. So we see these things, verse 5 and 6, we see the portion of the saints. Now in verse number 7, we see number 6, we see the principles from God. The Bible says in verse number 7, Psalm 16, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. And so David praises God for his counsel or for his word. We could put it that way if you'd like. We should do the same thing. God's counsel is wise. God's counsel is true. God's counsel is eternal. Listen, man's counsel changes a man, and oftentimes it has to, but I'm glad that God's counsel is forever settled in heaven. It's eternal, and it does not have to change. You see, the Bible says in Psalm 33, in verse number 11, it says, "...the counsel of the Lord standeth forever." the thoughts of his heart to all generation. So we need to be seeking the Lord's counsel because it is eternal. Man's counsel is temporary at best. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, verse number 21, the Bible says there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. Listen, when you and I, when we meditate upon the Word of God and we put God's Word into practice, we will be blessed by our obedience to the counsel of God. You say, preacher, are you sure about that? I am certain of that because of what thus saith the Lord, of the, the Word of the Lord or the Bible. See, the Bible says in Psalm 1, in verse number one, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season." 
His leaf also shall not wither, but whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so we will, you will, I will, will be blessed by obeying the counsel of the Lord. See, the Bible says in Joshua, the book of Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8, the Bible says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now listen. For, they, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You're talking about blessings from the counsel of the Lord. We can be prosperous and have good success from being obedient to the principles of God. So David found instruction and direction by meditating on God's counsel throughout the night. Verse number eight, we're still in Psalm 16. Verse number eight, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Now, here is a verse that is rich in truth. In this verse, David reveals several reasons for his stability. He reveals several reasons for the uh, perseverance, I guess, if you can, so I can barely say those kind of words, but for the perseverance of his life, he gives us important elements of endurance in this verse. You see, notice that David said, I have set the Lord always before me. He does this always. Listen, not sometimes, but always he sets the Lord before him. And, and and listen, if you're going to do that always, you're going to do it when you feel like it. You're going to do it when you don't feel like it. I'm afraid that there's many times that we want to, we want to set the Lord always before us, but oftentimes we decide to follow the desires of our own heart instead of being persistent and purposeful in having our heart follow the Lord. He said, I have set the Lord always before me. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29, Oh, that there was such an heart in them that way they would fear me and keep all and keep all of my commandments always. What, what is so needful about that? The Bible goes on to say that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Now, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 23, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn the, to fear the Lord thy God always. Hey, we move to the New Testament, the book of Acts. The Bible says in chapter 24, verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Wow. Want to be a blessing? We could always have our conscience void of offense toward God. I, I think that's doable. But how about and toward man? And so God help us to always have a, a, a conscience void of offense. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, this word abounding is having a great plenty, prevailing, increasing. Listen, we need to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. We, that, we, we need to have a great plenty work of the Lord. We need to be prevailing in the work of the Lord. We need to be increasing in the work of the Lord. So God help us to do that. Now, in our text verse, we're in verse number 8 of Psalm 16. David said, I have set the Lord always before me. Now, in this phrase, this little phrase before me, there are wonderful truths or elements of endurance. Now, the Bible mentions several things that are before us. Some of these things will help us and some of these things will hinder our endurance and our faithfulness in the Christian life. But let's look at some things that the Bible says are always before us. And uh, some of these things we need to strive after. Some of these things are warnings of things that, that are going to be in our life that we need to abstain from or guard against. And so, first of all, the provision of God is always before us. That's a blessing, amen. That's something we can rest assured of. The Bible says in Psalm 23, and verse number 5, 
Uh, the psalmist said, Thou preparest a table before me. Now, now look where this is at. In the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And so the psalmist said here, Even before my enemies, no, even in the presence of mine enemies, thou preparest a table before me. Ain't that a blessing? Now, the shepherd here, the shepherd would prepare the grazing pasture for the sheep before they were ever brought to the pasture or to the table. He would, he would clear the area of debris. He would clear the area of entanglements. He would clear the area of poisonous plants. And uh, he would do everything that he could to keep the predators from, uh, from penetrating the place where the sheep were at at night. And so our shepherd, our great shepherd, the Bible says, uh, our shepherd, Jesus Christ, provides for us too. His provision is right before us. May we ever be grateful for his care and for his kindness and not take it for granted. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so the provision of God is always before us. That's a blessing. Now, here's something that's not such a blessing. There is pain before us. The Bible says in Psalm 38, in verse number 17, the psalmist said, For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. Continually. The psalmist said, I am, I am at a place in my life where I am fixing to stop. I'm, I'm fixing to halt. And uh, the reason for that is, is that my sorrow is continually before me. Listen, friend, I don't have to remind you of this. You know it. Life is full of troubles and life is full of sorrow. Without the Lord's help, I promise you that life's troubles, life's sorrows, and life's problems can certainly overwhelm us and cause us to halt. Now, that word halt means to stop. If we're walking, the halt, the halt means to stop. It can also mean to limp or, or it can mean to stop with lameness or to hesitate. And so if we're not careful, we'll allow things in this life that are continually before us to hinder our walk with Christ, to cause us to limp in our walk with Christ, or cause us to come up lame altogether and completely stop in our walk with Christ. And so sometimes, so, listen, this continually before me, unfortunately, as far as in this life and on this earth is concerned, there, there, it may very well seem that our problems never go away. This is how David felt when he said that his sorrow was continually before him. That word continually means habitually. It means without cessation or hesitation. And so they were continually there. And uh, listen, do you ever feel like your pain and your sorrow will never go away? And uh, it may not, it may not. I, I'm not trying to be um, a downer. <laughs> And I'm not trying to tell you that there's no hope, but it may very well be that your problems never go away uh, this side of eternity. But I promise you this, friend, uh, we have an answer. And that answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that relief may not come on this side of eternity. But I promise you one thing. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, there is a brighter day and a better day and a pain-free day coming, amen. And that's the day that we're looking forward to, spending all eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the provision of God is before us. There is pain before us. There are problems before us. In Psalm 51, in verse number 3, David said in that psalm, he said, For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Now listen, I, I want you to understand me clearly here. Uh, sin is a problem. Guilt over that sin can sometimes be relentless and it can hound us relentlessly. Now I, I understand and I'm so, so grateful for the fact that God forgives sin. Uh, and when God looks upon us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of his dear son. That's a great blessing. But I promise you, friends, sin in your life can certainly, uh, it can certainly steal your joy. It can wreck your confidence. It will cause you to be bitter at others. Guilt will cause you to be depressed over your past mistakes and sin. The Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse number 17, it says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him with sin. 
And so it may not be that you have done something in your past that you uh, that is hanging over your head as guilty. It may be that you should have done something and you didn't do it. And that's sin as well. You see, in the Bible, there is sin of commission, sins that we commit, and there's sins of omission, sins that we fail to do, things that we fail to do that cause us to sin. And so there are problems before us and our sin is ever before us. So God help you and I to, listen, if we don't get victory over this, that guilt will lead to depression. And and I promise you, friend, in, in all truthfulness, in all honesty, the closer that we get to the Lord Jesus Christ, the more wicked and vile we realize that we are. And that's just the truth of the matter. And so in this verse, David said, I acknowledge my transgression. Aren't you glad that we can repent? Isn't it a blessing that we can repent? You know, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So friend, if you you think you're all holy and self-righteous and you have no sin, well, I, I just read you what the Bible has to say about that. Verse number nine says, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Listen, friend, when we repent and ask God for forgiveness, the slate is clean as far as God is concerned. Paul didn't allow the sins of his past to hinder him from going forward and, and doing the work of Christ and doing his best for the Lord. And, I, and I, we don't have time to go into what kind of lifestyle that Paul lived and what he did. But he said in Philippians 4, 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Listen to this phrase. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, if it was 20 years ago or if it was yesterday, confess it, turn from it, receive God's forgiveness and forget it, amen, and go on serving the Lord Jesus Christ the best that you can for what days that you have left upon this earth. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14 and verse number 17, in fact, in that passage of scripture, there is a threefold formula for removing guilt in our lives. Here's what that Bible says in, in, in Romans 4, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meek, meat, M-E-A-T, meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so here's, we don't, this is not the message either, but for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. So I promise you, the kingdom of God is not an earthly or physical kingdom. But of but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so we see clearly that the kingdom of God is a spiritual, heavenly kingdom. Now, there's three things mentioned here: righteousness, peace, and joy. First of all, righteousness comes by taking full responsibility for your sin confessing it to God and putting it behind you. Wish we had time for all these verses. Isaiah 118, the Lord said, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We need to stop resisting the Lord and plead our guilt before Him. And when we do, we find forgiveness and new freedom in Christ Jesus. So righteousness comes by taking responsibility for your sin. Peace comes by putting your sin and your failures behind you. The Bible says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. If you want to have peace, friend, you're going to have to love the law of, law of God, and loving the law of God will cause you not to be offended. Many of you have no peace because you are offended. In fact, I'm amazed at how quickly some people... So-called Christian people, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are so quickly offended. It proves that they have no peace because they do not love the law of God. Now, also there's joy. Listen, where do we get joy from? Joy from the Holy Spirit comes by praising God for His forgiveness and yielding to His Word. The Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 8, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. 
I'm glad that joy comes from realizing that we do not have to perform from God to be accepted by Him. We need to praise Him for His acceptance of us. My time is gone. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Bear Trail Baptist Church broadcast. May God bless you until we meet again is our prayer. Thank you so much for watching on social media. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again next week, same place, same time. Until then, hope you have a great week. God bless.